and welcome back to the Canadian Ruck. Uh, this is Jamie Gray coming to you from Ross Saint New Brunswick and uh, just you know had a little vacation there. Hopped across the uh, Confederation Bridge with uh, my wife Emily and our youngest Rylan. Our oldest Bailey wasn't able to get uh, get over with us but we enjoyed a few days over in uh, beautiful Prince Edward Island. Uh, had a nice little cottage rented in uh, Stratford uh, right across the harbour from Charlottetown. Got to do some tourist things even though COVID had a lot of things shut down. It was still nice to you hit the beach for a bit, do some mini putting, uh, just enjoyed a, a little downtime away from a lot of things. So uh, it was very enjoyable. Uh, but uh, we're back. We're excited. Our guest this week is none other than Pam Buisa. We'll get to get to Pam's bio in a couple of minutes, but she is a rising superstar for Canada Sevens and a great, great lady to chat with. Uh, we'll get to Pam shortly. Just want to remind everybody, um, we're on a variety of platforms. As you're well aware, we're, we're streaming on YouTube, we're streaming on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. Uh, click subscribe, download, follow, listen. Send it out to send it out to your friends. You know, you know, give it to somebody to listen to while they're running the forklift at work, or uh, you know, somebody that does uh, drives a lot for work. Maybe it's uh, you know somebody that's a salesman and they've got an hour drive each day. Get them, get them to give a listen because there's uh, lots of great guests on all our pods. Uh, make sure that you're uh, making sure that you're doing your thing and spreading the word of the game the same as I am. Uh, we also have our website. It's not on there. I'll have to update this if you're watching on YouTube, but it's thecanadianrock.weebly.com where you can see all of our guests, uh, find links to streaming, and et cetera, et cetera. And anytime you want to contact us for Twitter at Canadian Rock. Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore rock, Facebook at the Canadian rock, and email, our Gmail is the Canadian rock at gmail.com. So I'll never hesitate, always reach out. Uh, I've had a few people messaging me over the last couple of weeks. It's been nice to hear from viewers and uh, people looking for guests, and we're doing our best to get those guests on. Coming up now, though, is, uh, is the rugby news, and this is going to kind of follow along with the theme of our, of our talk with Pam. Uh, so the big thing coming out of Rugby Canada is that Rugby Canada is establishing a Black and Indigenous and People of Colour, which is BIPOC, uh, working group and adopt zero tolerance environment. So they, the acronym is BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous and People of Colour. Basically what this is going to do is it'll develop an updated anti-BIPOC racism policies for all Rugby Canada staff, athletes, board members and related organizations. It'll develop uh, training curriculum and annual completion standards for all staff, athletes, board members, and related organizations. Uh, there'll be an independent third party complaint investigation body as well, and updated outreach objectives for Indigenous, marginalized, and low income communities to, uh, within the Rugby Canada strategic plan. And with that, Pam is a member of the committee, Pam, our upcoming guest. And uh, also, as Doug Frazier, friend of the pod, Doug's been on twice. so two key people that will be working in that area. And this is uh, very long overdue from Rugby Canada, but hats off to Rugby Canada for taking this step forward and for letting people like Pam and Doug push this and lead the charge in helping Rugby Canada develop better policies uh, to make Rugby Canada a better work environment and a better place for those uh, aspiring rugby players and people in the business who are looking for jobs. Uh, so good on Rugby Canada for doing that and great on Pam and Doug for uh, helping me the charge. Uh, great area this week, and not to, not to, sorry, not to undermine or uh, lowball any of the news because there has been a lot of news we're going to stop a little bit more Beaumont World Rugby and the voting platform. Uh, Fiji, Fijians weren't very happy. I think it was Fijians. Um, weren't very happy with how it went down. You know, lots of years that we've got Southern Hemisphere with uh, New Zealand kind of building their own uh, Super Rugby uh, Union, and we, we've talked about that before, but it's looking like uh, that's you know, going to happen, where it's going to be New Zealand teams and Australian teams and, uh, you know, Pacific Rim team maybe, meaning that uh, South Africa is probably going to be going and playing in Europe. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be huge. Um, rugby Championship. Uh, they're still looking at how they can play that, if they can play that. Uh, Super Rugby Arteroa is going strong. They had some great games last week and even last night. This is, I'm recording right now, Saturday the 25th. The, the game last night between the Crusaders and Hurricanes was beautiful. I'm um, a Crusaders fan. They lost, but it was a 
amazing game to watch. Um, you know, Pro Rugby in Europe will be starting up soon. Friend of the pod, Tyler Arjon, will be taking the pitch shortly with uh, with Castro. And the sporting world all over. Baseball started up. Hockey's going to be starting soon. Basketball started. Uh, it, it's just nice to see all of this taking place. And that that brings us to our gray area of the week. And this 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 week, this pod, it's a little different. Um, with everything being canceled, the Sevens World Series was officially canceled. Um, but saying that Rugby Canada is mandated, or that, not mandated, they said that provincial unions, uh, they can use some guidelines, filter this information out. And depending on your union, I guess it, it, it depends on how clear the communication is from unions uh, as to what, what clubs can do. So I know it's been a touchy subject in some areas of New Brunswick, um, but I know most of those teams have started, able to get some work in and get some uh, reps on the ball. Uh, there's obviously a massive screening component. Uh, you know, they have to take care of uh, all the COVID questions like you would as if, you know, you're going into uh, different er areas of, of, of the public. And uh, I think that's what the teams are kind of focusing on. Um, it's not even touch at the moment. Uh, social distancing rugby uh, with uh, intent that will maybe get to touch at some point this year with uh, <laughs> broad vision that it might actually get into the actual rugby matches. I'm not sure if they'll get that far this season or not. But it is a neat way to keep people invested. And a lot of people come out of high school and they're looking for a place to go. So it is a great way for those clubs to try and keep um, those younger kids uh, readily available. <laughs> it's a great way to make sure that the game is kind of continuing in a sense. Um, saying that, it kind of it kind of comes to my gray here. And this is when I kind of want some feedback. Uh, I'm 43. I haven't played now. I hung up my boots 17 years ago. It's been 17 years since I've actually played a game of rugby. Uh, hung them up at 27. I had neck surgery, uh, nine concussions. Uh, I'd suffered from post-concussion syndrome for the last you know, 17 years. Over the last couple of years, I've been pretty good. Um, most of those concussions have been were from hockey. Um, but I am, uh, my plan is right now, so on Thursday, Coming up, whatever that is, the 30th, I plan on going out to, to Blyle and uh, and putting on as much gear as I can and uh, and taking part in the practice for the first time in 17 years. Uh, am I crazy? Um, is this the right time because it is, there is no contact and I can take my 43-year-old body around and, you know, I'm still going to be sore when it's done, but, um, you know, I'm not going to be lumping off the field. Um, so the no contact is kind of a nice little incentive for me to, to kind of get back out and get my hand on a ball. Um, also a, re a chance to really kind of reconnect with my old club. Uh, I've watched, I've watched a number of games. My oldest boys played a handful of games with him over the last couple of years when he's not at university. Um, so I've kind of, you know, I've kind of still watched some, um, but there's a lot of new faces there. And, uh, and I know a couple of my older, a couple of the older guys that are still there, I played with them when I was kind of finishing up and they were younger, but it, it'll be nice to see them. Uh, again, so I guess the great, am I crazy for thinking this? That, you know, as a 43-year-old, I can get back out and do a little bit and have a little bit of fun? Or is it the right time because of the no contact at the moment and it's kind of an easy way into it? I, I really want to hear from you guys. Um, hit me up on Twitter, or Instagram, Facebook, or email me. Send me an audio clip with your thoughts. Um, <laughs> don't hold back if you think I'm stupid or maybe you think I'm chicken because I didn't do this before um, that's all on, all on whatever you want to say but I think it's kind of a neat, neat idea to, to kind of give it a go uh, as my wife has said a number of times you know, this is the one thing that you talk about most is that you miss playing the game and we've been married it'll be 12 years tomorrow on the 26th and uh, she said you know since we've been married me before you always talk about how you, how you miss playing it I think for a lot of athletes, whether you're, you know, me that was a Saturday rugby guy and, you know, practiced and stuff, um, or whether you're a professional athlete, um, when, you, when you have to quit or retire because of injuries, you're not leaving on your own volition. And I think it can stay with you longer and sometimes harder than those that can kind of go at the top of the game or, you know, <clears throat> I guess dictate or mandate when they go out themselves um, based on, the fact that they just want to hang them up. Uh, I didn't have that choice with uh, with rugby or hockey, and uh, uh, I don't know. Am I too old to, to be thinking this is a smart thing to do? Um, 
is it laughable? Is it something that uh, could be fun? Uh, as I said, I want to hear from you. Hit me up on uh, social media. Hit me through email. Send me an audio clip. Um, let me know what your thoughts are. That'll be, it'll be a lot of fun to hear what people have to say, I guess. Well, that brings us up to our, our guest. So coming up next is Pam Finette Pisa, uh, maybe better known as Pam. Pam is a sevens up-and-coming superstar, uh, talented, talented woman on the pitch. Uh, she's already won 2019 Pan Am Gold last year. Uh, and she had Olympic aspirations this year, and now she has an extra year of training uh, with the Olympic uh, Olympic Games being held in 2021. And uh, I, I I don't see any reason why we're not going to see Pam uh, representing Canada on that sevens world stage at the Olympics, and she's going to be dynamite for us. That's the rugby side. Uh, rugby side, Pam can talk rugby all day with anybody. Um, but we, we get to see Pam on a deeper level, and that's uh, my, my other um, big thing I love talking about. One is rugby, and two is human rights. And Pam is a staunch, Pam is a staunch advocate for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, recently out in Victoria, B.C., she was the primary organizer of a peace rally for the Black Lives Matter with over 9,000 people in attendance. That's really impressive. I attended the one here in St. John, and the, and the organizers estimated it was between four and 5,000. Uh, so uh, Victoria is you know, pretty much twice as much, and she was one of the leads for that. Uh, I already mentioned about Pam being on the BIPOC Committee for Rugby Canada, which is awesome. And uh, she's also, not only is she a tremendous rugby player, but she's also finishing up her degree in university. She's taking a poli-sci degree. And mark my words, if she wants, she's going to be prime minister of this country. Uh, you know, Buisa for, Buisa for prime minister in 2035, maybe sooner. Uh, she's got a lot of interesting ideas um, with that political science background, um, captivating speaker. She's kind of got that whole package that you want in a political leader. So stay tuned because Pam's coming up. You're not going to want to miss this. Crack a beer, kick back and relax and uh, enjoy this great conversation with Pam Lisa. All right, welcome back to the Canadian Ruck. And we're lucky enough to, and very fortunate enough to have Pam Finette Buisa on with us today. Uh, a great athlete, great seven-side player. Panfinet, welcome to the Canadian Rock. Hello. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's jump right in. So talk to us about your involvement. Like, how did you get involved in rugby? It actually was a funny story. I started playing basketball, and I constantly got fouled out. I was way too aggressive. <laughs> it was just like every game, couldn't finish the game. And this one time, I had my rugby coach. Uh, there was a rugby coach that was watching me play, and he like pulled me aside after I got fouled out. He's like, "Why don't you just try a sport where you're allowed to kind of hit people?" And I said, "Hey, it's fun to do so." Um, and at the time, I was playing volleyball and basketball, and then rugby was introduced, and I was like the youngest player on the team, and I was like nervous, and I was like lanky, tall, muscular, and I was like felt so weird. And then once I got on the field, and I realized like, oh, being physical is good, and allowed and I just ever since then my eyes were open and it just kept going. That's cool. What's it, how were you like what were you in high school? Was this like Yeah, I was in when I first got exposed to rugby I was in grade seven and I joined I joined in grade seven. Yeah, so I was like how old is that like twelve or thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. Were you on the high school team? Yeah, so I played I jo I played with the uh older girls, so like the so it was a junior high, so it was uh, Hadley Junior High School, and then played uh, Phillips and Wright, which is the high school. And I was like the youngest player with all the senior girls, and I was like so intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool, though. It's it's uh, shows a lot of perseverance on your behalf for sure, a lot of courage too. <laughs> all right, so from there you moved on to UVic. Uh, it's a, a great rugby school. How did mm -hmm. playing at UVic help prepare you for the sevens national side? Tremendously. It was actually a really interesting time when I first came to UVic. The summer, before, like that summer leading up, I didn't know what university I was going to go to. I actually was scheduled to go to Concordia. And then I came out uh, to BC for a training camp, came out here super excited, and I dislocated my shoulder. And I was like, what am I going to do? And then I, you know, was talking to different coaches, was talking to my parents, and I was like, if I want to make the national team, I have to just do it move across the country with no actual idea as to what's going to happen but you know I connected with the, the head coach Brittany Waters and she basically was like if you come out here we'll you know support we have uh, sports doctors that are there 
Um, and I did play basically the entire season until my shoulder was completely fine. I played the final um, regular season game, played Can West, and I went to Nationals. And through there, um, I was able to kind of build my confidence back again to further and continue to the national program. So it was, it was really a pivotal time to help me gain that confidence. That's great. So uh, yeah, it had a lot of a lot of huge impact on you as a player. I imagine it helped you as a person too, moving so far away from home. You know, learning learning more about yourself as a as an individual to help you, I guess, become a better athlete on the field too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so you're young in your career. You're in your early twenties, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really re I don't really remember my early twenties, but I think I had fun. <laughs> But so far, you've had an impressive start, all right? You, you, you were in the Pan Am Games last year, correct? I was, yeah. Talk to us about that, like the event itself, the pressure you faced, the camaraderie involved. Like rugby is a huge family sport. It's huge into camaraderie. Talk to us about how that impacted you as a young member of that team. It was so cool to see because it, it was a younger side. We had a mix of like older girls and, and younger ones, and I kind of was – in a weird place because I, I wasn't necessarily the youngest or the oldest, but kind of in the middle. So kind of taking on that role and um, being in Peru, uh, that was my first time ever there and just kind of seeing um, what that meant to represent Canada on that scale um, and at a, at a multi-sport game. And that was something that was also quite new to me. Um, and just seeing, especially with the Canada House and seeing other athletes that are there and seeing where we were located, where the stadium was located, um, that was so amazing to see and like where our stadium was located was in a predominantly kind of low income area and just seeing like what it meant it was not just the fact that we're in the Maple Leafs but it was like there's so many people that you know either benefited or you know were hurt from the situation but we're here and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that um, and it was an honor to to be with my teammates um, and to push ourselves throughout that whole competition because it was a whole, it was a mental, a mental thing was to, you know, get to the final and then to, you know, beat U.S. in the final with a more experienced size. Um, but that belief was so um, paramount to our success. So it was, it was just so beautiful to, to that come together. It goes up again. So, yeah. That's, that is, that is beautiful. I, I love how the, that close-knit atmosphere happens in rugby and can take you many different places. And it was supposed mm -hmm. to take you to the Olympics this year. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, COVID has, you know, wrecked a lot of people's aspirations. It's, it's played havoc in a lot of people's lives. Um, but for, you know, for somebody like you, you're, you were probably going to be going to the Olympics. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's a really strong chance. I think you would have been there personally. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the prep work going into that and what you're doing now to kind of stay rugby ready you know, during COVID, like physically, mentally, I know you're back at, you know, you're back at university. I saw some Instagram posts where you're back in the gym. Mm -hmm. It's what you're doing to keep yourself as ready as possible. Very much has been a lot of like mental and physical nourishment. So I haven't, I, I realized that I, I thought I could be a free spirit, but I need structure. <laughs> so, <laughs> literally as soon as it happened, I bought a bike. I tried to get a full-time job. I was like, how can I engage in community? I was like, this, I can't, <laughs> I can't just sit back and do nothing. And I realized that um, what COVID has really taught me is rugby is something I do because I love, but what's allowed me to love it so much is community. And what rugby has allowed me to experience is community. And so a lot of what has allowed me to love and continue to love the sport that I do is by engaging with community and finding other aspects that can help me find uh, passions and other things, such as um, talking about um, and just our happenings, but also still training um, and doing speed and conditioning and doing skills and just refining the things that I know to be true, but also connecting with different groups that I haven't had the opportunity to do. And so I think that also allows me to appreciate um, wearing the maple leaf and what that means and um, yeah, just, it's opened my eyes so much this entire time, like what isolation does to people and where their minds go and how can we unify people when you feel like you're isolated. Yeah, for sure. You, you, I noticed that here over in the East Coast, I'm in New Brunswick, and mm -hmm. you notice some people that accept it early and make the most of the situation and others that kind of cower behind what's going on. Um, 
you, you definitely see that you, you gather that sense from the athletes I've been talking to it and a lot of them are very similar to you like no well I've got to pick my life up and keep moving and keep training and keep being prepared as best I can and it's mm -hmm. very yeah. that happening especially in somebody that's as young as you and, and you have that desire to uh, to advance so from there we're going to take a little break we're going to do what I call quick fire I've got mm -hmm. a questions this is it's a very fun time it, it kind of gives us a chance to see the fun side of Lisa okay <laughs> some of them are rugby related and and some of them are personal all right, ready ready all right number one best team you have ever faced Ooh, best team I've ever faced is my own team and inter squad oh are, yeah. you, are you saying that because you're scared next time you go for <laughs> No, because literally when I, I like my team because we're good and so having to play against them in inter squad and I'm like, okay, ready to go, then I'd say my own team. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. <laughs> Best player you have ever faced. Ooh. Best player I've ever faced, I would say that's a tough question. Um Megley Harvey. Yeah. Yeah. It's dynamite to watch, that's for sure. Yeah. I think I think it's like this is the beginning when I first got in the program and trying to defend her and her steps. Never figured it out. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I don't blame you on that one. That would be a hard one to try and figure for sure. <laughs> All right. So next one, toughest play you ever face. And what I usually tell people is, if you're looking up and somebody's coming at you with a ball, who do you mm -hmm. know it to be? Hmm. Uh, I have to pick one. You can have more than one if you want. I'd say, um, I'd say Brittany Ben. Okay. Just yeah. physically imposing or fast or? I think it's like her, her rugby IQ. She has very strong okay. rugby IQ. And so sometimes you think that you know what's going to happen and she kicks the ball and I'm like, I was so ready to tackle you and you <laughs> just did something. Didn't yeah. Happen. And she's super aggressive too. So, yeah. Oh, good combination. All right, sevens or fifteens? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to answer if you don't want to think you're going to get in trouble. I think I love both of them so much. I think fifteens is where I started, and um, it's also a reality check because when I came back and did like a, a um. They had like a Maple Leaf tour against England and the U.S. I realized I'm not the biggest player. So that was a rude awakening. And then going back to sevens, it's like a constant challenge of maintaining fitness and stuff. So I'd say both. You know, it's like, Two totally but, different games, right? So Very different games, yeah. yeah. All right. Best match you were ever a part of? Best match I was ever a part of? I would say uh, the... New Zealand final in, um, 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 I think it was, it was this season in Australia. No, not Australia. South Africa. It was a New Zealand final this year. I can't remember which tournament it was. It was the first time I've ever started against, um, or I, I started getting more minutes against New Zealand and just feeling like I knew what I was doing. You know, it was like that confidence of like, okay, we're, we're doing good things here. That was IQ, the best one. Your IQ is coming along too then. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, favorite, your favorite rugby tradition? Ooh, that would probably be um, before we get on the field. Um, it's like having a, a serious dance off, like just jamming <laughs> before. Like music's going. I got the African vibes, Afro beat going, got everybody dancing. That's, that's it. All right. So this is, a, I'm just <laughs> throw this one. Who's the best dancer? Ooh, I would always say myself, but <laughs> I'd say, I'd say Charity Williams, you know, she could, she's got a couple of moves that I won't give her complete credit, but I'd say myself. All right. Who's the worst dancer? Who's the one doing the shopping cart because they don't know what else to do? Um, I would say... She'll Landry. Yeah, she'll, she'll never like fully dance and she'll be like, she'll just look at me like, what am I doing? But hey, <laughs> yeah, 
Vista. Yep. All right. Uh, best team you have ever played with? Uh, best team I've ever played with? Uh, I'd say I've been on so many different teams. Uh, I'd say the, like the Canadian team, just because I feel like I've, I was with them for the longest amount of time. Um, I feel like I've changed so much in that, my time on the team. Um, so yeah, I'd say the Canadian team. Okay. What's your, your rugby nickname? I don't know. I think probably something along the lines of having to do with moving people, um, <laughs> being able to to run over a couple of people is kind of where my nicknames kind of fall in line of. But yeah, I don't. <laughs> so what is it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Something. <laughs> I've heard like like beast monster. Uh, Okay. Something along those lines, yeah. That's fair. All right. <laughs> Other than dancing, do you have any game day superstitions? Um, game day superstitions. Uh, I have to have play gospel before and have a serious, like, warm up, like, in my room before anything happens. And it's composed of me singing and stretching and listening to only gospel music, and no one can interrupt me. So what happens if somebody interrupts you? Do you have to restart your routine? That never really happens. Okay. <laughs> everybody knows to stay out. Every everybody knows, yeah. I mean like usually it's like me obnoxiously singing and then <laughs> yeah. So you're a good dancer but not a good singer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can rally, I can rally. <laughs> All, right. All right. So uh I'm I've got twenty minutes left on the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. It's mm -hmm. a really incredible series. So the next question is have you seen have you seen it? I've I'm waiting to see it. I feel like I've been like, I, I, I feel like it's one of those like documentary series that I have to like watch, but I haven't had a chance to complete. I've, I've got the, the, the get this of it though. Okay. So the next one is who would your Jordan and who would your Pippin and who would your Rodman be of players that you've played with? So Jordan would be like the, the like. Superstar, crazy intense, win at all costs. Hmm. <clears throat> And then the Rodney would be Rodman would be a person who might not get as much recognition, but does all the gritty, dirty things it takes to win. Some mm -hmm. might get in trouble with the coach. And then <laughs> the Pippin would be your number two, like the person that's always there but doesn't get as much recognition, maybe as number one, but always does the right things. I would say um, Charity Williams would be the person that doesn't get a lot of recognition. So Pippin, okay. Yep, I would say she is extremely hardworking. She inspires me a lot. She, she was a lot of speed. Woman. Yeah, a lot of speed, but also like she is a very caring person and I feel like, you know, to be the first black woman to have gone to the Olympics um, the seventh, that's something that has never been done and uh, she feels a lot of responsibility. So yeah, especially Sherry Williams. Um, I would say, um, who am I missing? Uh, Rod Rodman and Jordan, so the gritty, dirty player and then the superstar. Superstar. Who's a superstar? Not a lot of superstars on my team. Uh, yeah, just Lane. Yeah, I think she just, she's the captain that leads by example, is like ready to be there at any time. Unless it's past her bedtime, which is nine o'clock, but before that, fully available, checks in, just so humble. It's fascinating. Like, I've never met someone so humble like that. You know, like, yeah, she's inspirational. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, um, I would say Sarah Caljuvi. Okay. Yeah. She's extremely resilient. Just hearing her story and her, um, her, she just works so hard and even if it's you know whether she's an impact sub or she starts or her mindset going into practice is just she's intense she has a big voice <laughs> she's a presence but I would say that um, for someone to be so resilient and hardworking and just um, pushes herself every single time 
is something that I aspire to to get to and to work towards. So having these people as my teammates, like my entire team, we're all inspirational in different ways. But <laughs> it's hard yeah. to choose one, eh? That's the thing. <laughs> all right, chips or cookies? Ooh, chips. What kind? Ooh, it have to be the um, honey Dijon. Um, what's that? The honey Dijon chips of any sort. I don't think I've ever had those before. Ooh. Good. I recommend. I'll have to find them. Uh, French fries or onion rings? French fries. French fries or poutine? French fries. Are you from Quebec or Ontario? I am from Quebec. Oh, and you're not not voting for poutine? I mean, I feel like, I feel like, um, I feel like poutine, I mean, it starts with the French fries. Fair to enough. have, so I'm kind of saying I'm kind of it's kind of a compromise in my response. Okay, all right, that yeah. seems, that seems reasonable. Uh, favorite <laughs> beer. Favorite beer. I don't like any beers. Okay. Uh, guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. Hmm. I would say singing karaoke in my car. Okay. If I get in your car and you and I are going to the stadium for a game, what are you, what are you singing? Um, what do I have to try and tune out? Tune out? <laughs> <laughs> You've already told me you're not a good singer. <laughs> I mean, like, it's not like I'm a bad singer. I, I, think I'm a, I think I'm a pretty good singer. I think I'm a good okay. singer. Okay. All right. But I think, <laughs> I think um, I definitely will have some Alicia Keys last dance. You'd have to, you know. You'd have I, to I like Alicia Keys. Yep. Um, you know, probably a bit of old school, um, Afrobeat for sure. I don't know what your Afrobeat IQ with that is, but that has to be up to par. <laughs> I'll, I'll learn. I'm a, a <laughs> 80s hard rock guy. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, best place for a post-match gathering? Best place for a post-match gathering would probably be the hotel. Because afterwards, everybody's tired, and then you usually are in the hallways, and everybody's just like, so how are you feeling? And we're like, I don't know. It's just like decompressing. Yeah. At least, at least my experience, a lot of times, would be like after an international tournament, and then we're just kind of like, hey, I'm exhausted. You're going to go but I don't know. But you want spirit? Yeah, okay, cool. See you later. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah. Just chill yeah. mates. Just chilling. What series are you binge watching right now? Series in my binge watching. I just finished. Um, what was the last one I finished? Uh, it's on Netflix. It's called. Oh, I finished RuPaul's Drag Race. Actually, how was that? That was a good one. Pardon? How it was good? That was good. Very good. Yes. Um, that I also I was because I was undoing my braids and it took a long time and so I had a lot of <laughs> a couple hours to I don't have much to, I don't I'm <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. So, okay so what's your favorite movie Ooh, pursuit of happiness ah that's a good one mm. yeah who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life um hopefully Denzel Washington but that wouldn't really work that well but hey it's your movie hope- yeah, we're born on the same day, actually. Nice. A couple okay. years apart. A yeah. couple years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Den- Denzel's playing Pam Weezia. Who's yep. the leading opposite? Who's the? Who's playing the leading opposite? The leading opposite would be, hmm. It would be Viola Davis. Oh, nice. Yep. All right. Last quick fire. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? Biggest impact for me as a player? Uh, my parents. All yeah. right. So quick fire is over. Get some good laughs in there. So we're getting back mm-hmm. to more rugby, <laughs> more rugby questions. What are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? You've, sh- you've, you've already given me some names of some that you've shared the pitch with. You've kind of given me some of those attributes. But if, if you could – mold what you think the perfect rugby player is character grit skills what what 
what are you looking for in the embodiment of a teammate, a great team player? Someone who puts the team first. And that's actually one of our team mottos is someone that um, is willing to be a technician, whether that be watching video, whether that be showing up to, prep, to mobility sessions, coming early, um, is speaking up when they need to speak up, is questioning certain things um, when they don't understand, being okay to be vulnerable and be in positions where they allow themselves to be uncomfortable for the betterment of the team. Whether that be you are extremely tired at the end of that conditioning set, but you're still pushing yourself because you have to. Um, and I see a lot of my teammates that do that time and time again. And like, I've been on the team for five years, but there's been some that's in there for like, a lot longer. And just seeing like the people like Bianca Ferrella, who's just so focused, the Kayla Molesky that I think she's just not only such a ball of energy and just so loving, um, but just like, I just see my teammates that they care so much and um, people that just care about community, but also know the work that it takes to be excellent and to be great and is willing to push themselves in a way that inspires people around them. Yeah. I think that uh, that sums up a lot of your teammates for sure. Mm -hmm. And culture, that community culture, the family culture. Um, a lot of women there that have a lot of character, a lot of grit, a lot of determination and perseverance. And that makes for an amazing squad for sure. Mm -hmm. As a rugby player, so you're young. But if you could, you know, 15 years down the line, you're, you know, you're, you're hanging up your cleats. Mm -hmm. What do you, what, if you're looking back, what would you want to be remembered for as a rugby player? As someone who didn't shy away from confrontation on and off the field. Someone that gets on the field and will take up space, will bring her team forward by running over opposition <laughs> or just moving opposition out of the way, but also someone that um, will confront hard issues within society um, and does not shy away from being uncomfortable, but puts herself in that position. That's a, that's a beautiful segue into our next little section. <laughs> it's like it was rehearsed, but it wasn't. <laughs> so it's been, it's been over a month since the George Floyd incident happened. Mm -hmm. I had Doug Frazier on uh, a few weeks ago, and we had a good lengthy chat about it. As I told you before, I started recording. I teach history and socials. Um, and, you know, this was brought, we were doing online learning at the time, but this was a huge topic of discussion in all my classes. Uh, my family and I have got, you know, I'm married. I have a 23 year old son and 11 year old son. And we attended the Black Lives Matter rally here in St. John. There's about 5,000 people that showed up. Uh, wow. Everybody wearing masks, listening to the speakers. Um, and it was just, it was a beautiful moment. Saying that, you're, you're an advocate. I, I see you on social media and Instagram for sure, posting. I was just checking before our call and you had posted a few new things. Um, as we get into this, I want you to kind of take the conversation where you want. I do have a couple of questions, but if you know, answer how you would like. But uh, mm -hmm. about a month ago, not even, I was listening to a health expert noting that racism is a more serious virus than COVID-19. What do you feel about that? I see it as two different viruses. I see it as them, like COVID-19 affects your system. It, it prevents you to breathe. It prevents you from being in proximity with other people. Um, it prevents you from um, a lot. It's literally slow down every single system in the world. Racism is similar to that in a way that can also prevent you from breathing, can also prevent you from um, coexisting within systems as well. But the thing that's different is that certain people benefit from these systems and other people are silenced from speaking up or feel like they can't speak up. And I think these two things are pandemics in themselves. Um, I think they're very different, but I also think there's a lot of similarities in the way that um, people are dying, people are in pain and people are isolated. And both these pandemics, um, those parallels but uh, are affecting our entire 
society, all of the entire world. I don't, uh, I don't think it could have been said any better than that, Pam. Uh, you summed up both of those very nicely. Um, so you're, you play for Canada, you're from Quebec, you're, in, you're living in British Columbia, but you're seven stores all over the world. Mm -hmm. Have you ever noticed a difference as a, as a strong black woman playing rugby while in Canada, mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe playing in a tournament in the States or overseas or somewhere? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that anything different how you're treated? Absolutely. I, uh, it's always interesting whenever I go like to different countries and, you know, oftentimes we are with our Canada, you know, like Maple Leaf and we're going about in different spaces. Um, and there's a certain level of privilege that comes with that. And one thing that I do know is wearing that, um, I can get away with certain things or I don't have to say certain things because, um, I can hide myself behind this make belief, you know, but as soon as I remove that, I cannot detach myself from the experience as a black woman. But um, it's interesting because uh, Canada in itself is um, something I'm so proud of. But I also know that the history in which it was founded upon was indigenous um, history as well. And the issues that have occurred through that um, and so I find that if I am not cognizant of what has happened in the past and I just reap the benefits of it, I'm only continuing that is the issues of that. I'm only perpetuating um, that. And so I think throughout this whole pandemic time, I feel like I'm going back and thinking about how am I um, speaking up and acknowledging where history is actually coming from? What does the 153rd year mean? What does that represent? What does me wearing the Maple Leaf represent as a Black woman? And how can I use my platform to um, speak out on these things, on these injustices, but also to highlight um, that I can no longer detach myself from certain situations because I too am a black woman. So it's been a lot of self-discovery in that way and like figuring out, figuring that out. Yeah, we, we, uh, we do have a great country, uh, but there's a lot of issues, as you've noted in our past, that it's hard to stomach sometimes, especially as a, you know, a 43 year old white man that mm -hmm. had nothing to do with that, but I still feel guilty and I'm not supposed to, but I still feel guilty about what has mm -hmm. happened to family and community members of this country of mine. Uh, mm -hmm. I, one of my units is, is residential schools and we spend about six weeks digging in deep and you know, our students come out of that class and they're just horrified that these things happened in our own country. And, you know, when, when I tell them that apartheid laws were basically based off of our, you know, horribly named Indian Act, uh, it mm -hmm. just blows the kids' minds. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, um, I'd like, actually, if, if you wouldn't mind, I might save part of this pod and play it for class next year while, while you're talking about this, if that would yeah. be Yeah, for sure. Um, so at, at my school, we have what's called an advisor system. So every day I meet with you know, I have nine kids that I meet with every day, grades nine through 12, and just for 15, 20 minutes, and we just chat, check in, have a good time. And one of my, one of my kids who just graduated, Sam, uh, he, he has an interesting story. He was, uh, he was born in, in Haiti, and he was adopted into a white family, and mm -hmm. his, was adopted into the same family, but they didn't know each other, like they went from the same family in Haiti. And he grew up, and he's a great hockey player. He played rugby. He's a really good rugby player. And uh, before I spoke with Doug Frazier, I said, listen, Sam, as a black man, have you ever faced any racism while you've been playing? And only once in his entire life playing hockey or rugby did he have somebody uh, hurl a racial uh, comment at him. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, have you ever faced discrimination during your career? So he actually wanted me to ask this to any athletes that I have on if they've mm -hmm. ever faced any discrimination, any racial discrimination, and if so, how did you act or respond to that situation? Um, I'd say within um, like daily training environment, um, I haven't necessarily felt um, discriminated against strictly because of my race. I felt like, um, as me personally, I wouldn't engage in anything that I know uh, that I'm not welcomed in. And I think it's just a testament of where we are at with our team and our coaching staff and, and how um, 
as allies, they're willing to, to hear us out. But I do think that, um, I think the systems that are in place um, allow for certain regressions to come along. Um, I think um, for myself, it's often been not necessarily on the field, but it could have been off the field where when people don't know, I play rugby for Canada. It's been oftentimes when I'm at a McDonald's and a security office, security guard is telling me that I just want to suck it up when someone calls me the N word, um, but also doesn't know that I can, you know, call the media in a second. You know, so oftentimes it's been um, when people don't know what I do. And that's that finally fundamental issue is that I always feel like I have to present my credentials, my status for someone to feel like what I have to say is valid or that my experience is valid. And I think that's been what a, a lot of what I've been trying to push for is the fact that, yes, I do play for the national team. But my first thing that I do is I'm black. And if people try to detach that or take that away, then you no longer see me. You only see what I represent. And the fact that people almost fetishize the idea of me, they no longer see me as the person. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the discrimination has occurred has been um, more so off the field or, um, yeah. You said it right there. You said people need to see me as a person first. And, you know, it's one thing that I try and push across my students is that we're all, we're all the same. We might have different upbringings. We might come from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. But at the end of the day, you know, if you cut me, I bleed the same color as you. Mm -hmm. um, I get hungry, you get hungry. I get tired, you get tired. I get scared, you get scared. We're, we all have those same emotions. We have mm -hmm. those same feelings. We're all inherently the same. We mm -hmm. just come from a different background or a different part of the different part of the world, different part of the country, different part of the province, even right. Mm -hmm. So, but you said that you, said, you know people need to see me as a person, and it's uh, gut wrenching when you say that doesn't happen because it's just not acceptable. It's not right. Mm -hmm. Uh, watching watching the demonstrations, there's, you know, I, I noticed a lot of times, sometimes violence would break out, and oftentimes, like what I what I would read and what I would understand, a lot of times the violence wasn't necessarily from the demonstrators; it was other people kind of jumping in and just mm -hmm. being jackasses, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I ML uh, Martin uh, Martin Luther King is a great advocate. He was a great advocate for peace. Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela is, you know, my grade eight ancient history course. Uh, I do a, a month-long unit on apartheid and learning about his process and his transformation from what he was like in the 50s and 60s, you know, until his time in prison and released. And he mm -hmm. pushed for peace. ML's mm -hmm. daughter pushes for peace down in Atlanta. What, mm -hmm. what do you say when, when, those violent when those demonstrations turn violent? Like, mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts as, as an advocate for equal rights and Black Lives Matter? What are your thoughts when, when some of those issues turn violent? Um, it's a very interesting question. I actually, I'm studying political science at school and uh, we talked about the right to fight for what's right. And we were discussing, you know, is fighting for what's right strictly peaceful? Is it violence? Is it being angry? Is it being, you know, having rage? And honestly, what I got from the class is, I don't know. <laughs> It was, it was very much like how does the police, how to show and express themselves in a way that can make change. And I think how I am choosing to answer this question and just how I'm choosing to, you know, like see, you know, when people are looting and people are upset is that I think people want change. And I think it's, it's difficult when, you know, if, an organizer is planning on having a peaceful rally and, you know, it turns violent and that kind of, you know, sways away from their message and how they would like to see or affect change. But I also know that certain people, you know, are so angry and um, they want to see change and they have been speaking up peacefully, but that hasn't been working. So they've reverted to more violent. And so for me, it's like, I haven't been in a position where I had to revert to violence. I haven't, um, yeah, but in a, in a place where I, I had to. Um, and that's not to say that I, I'm not where I haven't, but I, I have been in this space and in this, in my way of conveying change and evoking change is by conversation, by challenging, by putting pressure on certain systems. Um, and I think 
it's important for organizers and for people trying to affect change to also not weaken the voices of how people want to do and see change. So, yeah. I think that's, that's fair. I, like I've, I've, I'm, I'm with you. I've never been in that situation. I guess I always go to what Mandela did and, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm clearly not somebody like Mandela, but, you know, watching what he went through and urging the citizens of South Africa, you know, every color to know, let's move forward peacefully. I, mm -hmm. I, I, if that works, but I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. society's not there. Maybe society's reverted back to what it was long before Mandela went into prison. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what do you think is the biggest challenge with ending racism? Like you're in political science, uh, mm -hmm. and 10 or 15 years down the road, I want to see your name on the ballot uh, to vote for for prime minister. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what do you think needs to happen? What is the most press pressing issue? Like, there's lots of talk about systematic racism. There's talk about mm -hmm. you know, defunding the police. There's talk about this. There's talk about that. Mm -hmm. As a political science student, that's getting everything thrown at you right now. What do you think it is? I think what the first thing needs to happen is that there needs to be a shift in mindset. I think when we speak about systematic racism, we speak about um, you know, these institutions, we have to realize that that's composed of individuals. The individuals try to push their, their, their agenda and they make it too big and it's not relatable. It's hard to think that you can do something. When you can influence how you think, you challenge how you think, you can shift that narrative. You can expose yourself to a whole degree of experiences, even if you can never fully understand, but if you expose yourself and challenge why you feel a certain way, that can change something. It was dialogue, with conversation, with exposure, and critical thinking as to where you actually are. That's how you influence systems. Because systems, it's, it's a composition of different people with similar agendas that create these policies, that create legislation, all these things. And I think if as a collective, we all work to critically evaluate where we're at and to see where we're going, and I think that's where change can start. I think that's really good. Do you think, as, as a political science student, do you think our Canadian government's doing enough? I think there's room for everybody to do more. I think that That's, that was um, very political how you answered. <laughs> I think I think that um, I think it's important for the government um, to realize what land in which we're inhabited on, um, and to remember the historical um, issues that have occurred. Um, and the colonial background that that entails. And so I think if individuals can think as to where they come from or what the foundations of where, where they're at comes from, that can very much influence the way that they delegate and they can make policies and they can create change. Because again, that starts with individuals and thinking and how they think about certain things. So I could say, yes, the government can be better, they should be better, but at the same time, I can also say individuals can be better, because when individuals take that onus on themselves to make change, then that can create a whole new wave for institutional, systematic, governmental change. It's a long, it can be a long process, but I think it's one that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's switch gears. Our last question's on rugby. Mm -hmm. Any great rugby stories you can share with us? And feel free to throw some old teammates under the bus. Um, great. Let me show you to see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, man, so many. Just, just something that I guess maybe sums up what it's like to be on a, a competitive team with uh, lots of great characters and, and enjoying that family bond that you spoke of so, so much throughout this talk. Um, mm -hmm. or something fun that somebody did something so stupid that you'll, you'll never let them in the day. <laughs> <It's really laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't, I thought I was fair. I was like, I thought I was fair. I was like, I can't throw her under the bus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Caroline Crossley is a funny character. Let's just put it out there. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, um, she, 
Okay, I guess I can't tell that story. Let's see, let's oh, come on, you can't see. leave me hanging. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, so before every um, tournament, um, or before we get into everything, we have like a team meeting, and it's usually like a why we're here kind of meeting. And it's like a, usually a highlight video, highlight tale kind of style composed with our game analyst. And you'll find clips of like us doing something as a team, like getting a try or someone doing something individually or whatever. It's kind of like a highlight reel. And before, he'll usually start with like a compilation. And uh, <laughs> Caroline <laughs> and Olivia Apps <laughs> try to uh, remake the meat or like the funny home video of like the peanut butter video. So like they covered themselves head to toe in peanut butter. <laughs> And like put it on <laughs> why <laughs> to like remake that video oh. and so like because like <laughs> lives both so they like put it on so it looked like the baby and then they <laughs> <laughs> it was just a, but it was literally I was like this is exactly why I love this team so much <laughs> they are all so ridiculous and yeah it's funny and just like yep yeah, this is what we're gonna do because we have time in between our, our before the tournament this is the day off, and this is gonna be a funny thing to do to celebrate and to highlight that you know we all love each other. We're all here, and yeah. So it's <laughs> you have a copy of the video. So I don't know if I can disclose that, but if I can, <laughs> I'll send it away. All right. <laughs> all right, Pam. Thanks very much. It's been a it's been a true pleasure uh, chatting with you today. Uh, get some valuable insight on you as a person and with the sevens program and the you know, black lives matter movement. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you're a courageous woman and it was an honor to, to chat with you and wish you the best of luck with finishing up your poli sci degree and prepping for the Olympics next year. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks so much, Pam. That was a true pleasure chatting with you today on our podcast, uh, chatting great rugby, uh, listening to your stories and, and the Black Lives Matter movement, human rights, just uh, very heroic and commendable um, what you've been doing with the Black Lives Matter movement and organizing rallies and just speaking out and, and doing your thing. It's, uh, it's great to see and uh, love, love that aspect of you as a person and, uh, and on the pitch, you're just you're dynamic to watch. So massive thanks uh, for Pam for joining us. Um, love to get you on again. Uh, Oh, I say that with all my guests, but I truly mean it. I always want my, my guests to return. It's always great. Uh, coming up soon, though, we have Karen Paquin. Uh, great, great, uh, great interview. Very funny. Um, lots of great stories. We have uh, the dynamic Jeff Hassler as well. He'll be coming on shortly. Uh, long-standing hooker for Canada, Ray Barkwell. He'll be, he'll be up joining us soon. And we have Nadia Popov coming on. Uh, tough, tough player. Uh, human rights advocate as well. And then we have Mark Wyatt, a uh, dynamic player for Canada back in the 80s and 90s, representing Canada at the 87 and the 91 Rugby World Cups. And before we finish, as always, I want to say thanks to the essential workers, sports staff, volunteers, truck drivers, uh, grocery store workers, everybody that's been helping us out through this pandemic. Um, whether you're behind the scenes, whether you're front line, whether you're, uh, you know, continued to work while everybody else is laid off, whether you've been laid off because of you know, shortage in jobs or shortage in, in what have you. Uh, thank you so much. It's been, uh, it's been amazing to see and have people put their lives on the line for everybody else. Uh, I'd like to say, uh, give a shout out to Ben Sound Music for supplying us with our tunes as always. And uh, make sure, feel free, request topics. I had uh, David Castle message me uh, asking for a few names. So I'm, I'm putting some feelers out and I'm waiting to hear back. But uh, by all means, if you have anybody else you want to you hear on the pod, uh, reach out drop me a line and I will see what I can do. Um, so until our next pod, uh, this is Jamie. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and keep on rocking. <laughs>